Okay, I guess we'll get started here. Um, it's about time, and I know everybody's time is valuable here at uh, World Dairy Expo. So um, I'd like to welcome you today to the Dairy Forge Seminar. Uh, I appreciate uh, the invitation, and uh, hope, hopefully I can do the invitation justice. So one thing, um, I really enjoy producing forages, um, and by that I'm... I enjoy it year round. So I feed most of my hay that I raise, not all, but most. And uh, I, I enjoy the challenge through the growing season, but also uh, the months of December, January, February, when there's snow on the ground. Uh, if I have nice feed to feed my heifers, um, I get a satisfaction out of that. So um, at the moment, I'd like to introduce my family. My wife is in, in the back. You can raise your hand, please, Nancy. And our youngest daughter, Krista. Krista and her husband, Matthew, live in Germantown, Wisconsin. Uh, she's a full-time director for Mary Kay's Cosmetics. And our oldest daughter, Laura, teaches uh, ag education at South Dakota State University in Brookings, South Dakota. So, and also my brother, Dwight, happened to drop by today, too. So thanks, thanks for coming. So um, we're from Osceola, Wisconsin. That's Polk County, Wisconsin. It's northwest Wisconsin. Uh, it's about an hour and 10 minutes north of St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. So we're real close to the St. Croix River. Um, on a good clear day, I'm able to see the Minnesota River bluffs from our farm. So we raise corn, soybeans, mostly hay, and most of our hay goes to dairy heifers. Uh, some does get sold. So just uh, to be clear, um, so we're all on the same page. Um, I'll get to it in a little bit. But the goal for the farm is to raise as much 150, 160 RFQ hay that we can. And we try to raise, raise lots of it per acre. Okay, and probably four or five years ago, uh, prior to that, I only dry baled my hay. But four or five years ago, I went to baleage. And that has just been an absolute godsend this year. So... Um, we've had a lot of rain. So I'll just uh, recap our growing season. You know, in two words, it's very wet. Started wet, it was late. I probably didn't get my new seeding in until maybe April 15th or so. Corn was after that, and my soybeans were the first few days of June. And um, I don't think we went a week, I don't think we went more than six days without rain. So... Um, in, in our area, 40% chance of rain would equal half inch. So in other years, when it's dry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you wouldn't get anything. So, um, you know, the bad, up at home, there's a lot of long faces right now. So this past Sunday, we got between two and five inches of rain. And there's just a lot of corn silage that yet to be chopped. So both uh, do the winter kill and... Um, People try to need uh, make a more of a cushion for their forage, and I'd say there's maybe only about a third, maybe a third of the corn silage that shop that needs to get. So it's just going to be a long, hard fall. So, but hopefully, uh, we all know weather can change. So hopefully, it stops um, stops raining soon. So, um, do you want to go to the next photo? Okay, so like I say, we're a family farm. It's been in Nancy's family a long time, maybe, I think, maybe about 134, 135 years this year. So um, I'm fortunate that uh, alfalfa loves my farm. So I have Rothschild silt loam soil, and my t topography, uh, it's well-drained. So that, that helps a lot in growing the alfalfa. So we have uh, some contour strips that my father-in-law put in in the 1950s. And um, when Nancy and I came there a few years ago, uh, or I should say in the late 80s, we put in a few more contour strips. So one thing, um, we always have to guard, or I'm always on guard for erosion, um, just because um, soil type and topography. And my farm is like many other farms in the neighborhood. We're in, uh, in Wisconsin in the Horse Creek watershed. 
So um, part of the runoff that leaves my farm can end up in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're always try to do a good job with water quality. Um, I try to keep a hay on my erodible acres and uh, do the reduced tillage. So um, if you would click two slides, please. One more. Okay, so um, this is not pure alfalfa, but I, I'm going to call it alfalfa. Okay, so just so that's a mixed stand, but it, it's handled as alfalfa. Do you want to go one more? Okay, this is, I'm going to call this a grass. There is some alfalfa in here. This is fourth crop, but uh, um, I manage this as grass. So when I say alfalfa, it, it's usually, it's going to be mixed, and when I say grass, it's, it's mostly um, grass. So the most important number for my farm for forage is that uh, 150 to 160 RFQ. So that is a more important number for me uh, in my program than it is if it's 70% alfalfa, 30% grass, or 30% alfalfa, 70% grass. So I can make both types of hay work for me very well. So, give you a little history. Um, back in the mid 2000s, we sold our dairy herd, and um, I wanted to keep my my heifers and um, raise some hay on my erodible ground. So I talked to my nutritionist and I asked them. Um, I told them kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to do um, just very simple a hay and grain mix. I didn't want to monkey with the silos or do the chopping or anything like that. And he encouraged me that I could do a very good job doing that. Um, but there's a couple things. He said, uh, he, he um, told me I should put some grass in with my alfalfa to lower the protein. So he wants it uh, below 20% if I can. And then he said the forage quality de depended upon uh, what we would put in the grain mix, meaning if it was lower protein, we could up the protein in the grain mix and um, so forth. So um, that's what I did. So orchard grass was my first choice. So some people don't like it, but uh, it works very well for me. It does have a definite couple drawbacks, but I can easily live with those. So the first year that we seeded down, um, I didn't think it was too tough because um, it was just going to be heifer hay. So I just seeded it with oats, kept it for grain, seeded the alfalfa, and uh, orchard grass. Well, the stand that I got, I didn't, I didn't really like. So, um, and I, when I, we took the first test after the first crop, because I was used to all pure alfalfa. So once I got the first forage test back, um, then I was really disappointed. So I, I knew we had a lot of work to do. So I think one of the first things I did, I bought my own bale probe. So, because every time we bale, I started taking forage tests just so we get a, just so we get a read. It's kind of a report card on, um, on how you're doing that way. So the issue was, is for me, is how do I get, a, get my grass in the alfalfa? Okay, and, and done right. So I tried several different ways for a few years, and um, I really wasn't happy with any of them. So what I've done now, and I learned by accident, is that um, what I do now, could you go back two slides? There we go. Okay, this is how I like to seed my orchard grass in the alfalfa. So I start out with Roundup Ready alfalfa on my erodible acres, and now the last couple of years I've added the, the Harv Extra uh, low lignin alfalfa. So those fields are going to stay in hay six, seven, eight years. Um, you know, I figure Harv Extra in my book it pays it pays back every time you cut, either in quality or yield. So when it's going to be in forage that long, you know. I'm, I'm gladly will pay for the technology fee. So what, so if you, if you could go to, yeah, forward please. Uh, one more please. 
Uh, one more. I'm sorry. Uh, one more. I'm sorry. Okay. So this cornfield on the left, this helped me decide. Okay. So, and what I mean by that is um, a few years after we sold our cows, that's a, that, that chunk of cornfield right there is at, a, at the bottom of the hill where all the contour strips were, were. That for my farm, that is one gorgeous piece of dirt. Okay, I, I wish my whole farm was that. But anyway, what I'm getting at is after we sold our cows, that was our last field of hay to get plowed up. So the guys that custom combined for me, they had done over 1,500 acres when they got to my place. When they got to that spot right there, they got the highest yield bump on the yield monitor in over 1,500 acres. Okay, so I was very proud. That said, when I ordered, when I added up all my scale tickets, that was definitely not my highest yielding corn year. Okay, I was disappointed. So what it proved to me is if you're after big farm yields, okay, you have to do everything you can to get all your acres and all parts of the field to the best that you, the best that you can. So I took that same philosophy and I used it with Roundup Ready Alfalfa. So Roundup Ready Alfalfa, I feel that year after year gives me the most consistent stand. It, I feel that um, new seeding alfalfa is a poor competitor. It's, it, it doesn't compete well with the nurse crop. It doesn't compete well with weeds. It doesn't compete for um, the nurse crop that's taller. It doesn't compete well for moisture. So if you can take s some of that stress, some of the variability out of um, those issues, okay, it, it's, in my opinion, you start out with a better field of hay going forward. And then what we do is either the, f the fall of that year or the following spring, I take my grain drill, put some orchard grass, and I go over all that, all, all my hay fields, or that clear seeded. So, and that has worked out very well. So, I will caution you, you have to be very patient because, um, say by July 4th, you're going to think it was just a total waste of money because you can hardly find any orchard grass. But it's not too long. By the fourth crop, th you can see some. You can't really see it in the hay. But by the next year, um, you can definitely see it. So, and also starting with a good stand of alfalfa, it will stay alfalfa more percentage stronger with alfalfa um, longer. So... Okay, so um, I'll, I'll take you through a normal year for us. So in the spring and April, okay, as soon as it firms up and dries up, I like to get some fertilizer on all my fields. So I like to get some sulfur and some boron, some potash on all of them. I split that up at least twice. So one thing that is I've switched a few years ago is um, how I fertilize my I'm going to call it my grass. It's mostly grass. I manage it as grass. And that is um, three, four years ago, I went to fertilizing it four times a year. So I fertilize it between every cut. So, and I put about 30 to 35 pounds of actual N on per cutting. And also, when I do that, I add some sulfur. And AMS is my sulfur choice. So it just, I don't know the science behind it, but it seems like some sulfur added with the little bit of urea I used, it, it's almost like turbocharged nitrogen. So, and I, I am reminded fairly often how good that has worked for me. For instance, this year I ran out about an acre, acre and a half right next to a tr big tree line fence. So I did not go back into town to get any. So. It wasn't too long that uh, driving by at 55 miles an hour, I could tell exactly where it ran out of nitrogen, both in color and the yield. So two or three years ago when I first started to do it, um, I drove by a field and it, it had a wave like this. And, and I, I couldn't figure out 
so-called what the problem was till I came out with the disc bind to cut it and sure enough I had uh, my spread pattern was bad on the fertilizer spreader that I got so instead of spreading 50 feet it probably was only spreading like 35 <laughs> and, and again a big big difference um, it's visual so I've been very happy with that and um, uh, it's worked out well. Some a little bit with quality, you get a little boost in protein too, but it's only dry matter yield. So the first cutting, we, we try to take a first cut uh, fairly early. I'm not the first one to um, cut, but I'm not too far behind the first one. So what we do is um, all first crop is cut and wrapped. So I just try to get a cut, get it off, get it wrapped, get it made and let the sun a and uh, rain start on helping out the second crop. So, and to be honest, um, when I'm cutting first crop, there's definitely some orchard grass heading out. So, but it, it really hasn't hurt me the last four or five years. I've been able to um, still get that 40, one or 150 to 160 RFQ. So, um, you know, I can't prove this, but I do trap gophers. We have pocket gophers, so I'm out. I'm out a lot in the fields, like late March, early, as soon as the gophers are digging, and it just seems like the older grass stands are a little bit more even to wake up in the spring um, than the newer stands. So I think that helps. Um, all your orchard grass is not at the same uh, maturity um, when you first cut. So. After we get it off, within about seven days, because orchard grass starts to um, grow, you know, within like two days you can see new growth, um, we monitor for bugs, so, uh, for insects, so. And I, I will caution you here that um, if you have mixed stands or grass stands, if, if, if you think that uh, alfalfa weevil and potato hopper leaf, leaf hoppers are not in your, um, mixed stands they just go for the al alfalfa stands um, I can prove you wrong on that so um, I, I thought I would not have the uh, pest problem with the mixed stands but I do so mainly and they can come early if you cut early you know I've had I've had to spray uh, alfalfa weevil um, oh, by this by the 7th or 10th of June so we spray ourselves usually because um, well, that time my egg service is still spraying corn and beans, and they don't want to rinse out and uh, uh, spray spray my hay. So usually I end up um, just spraying it myself. But we try very hard to get it sprayed within uh, a, a day or two. Okay. So then for second, third, and fourth crop, that's where I try to get some of um, uh, my dry hay. So um, I, I try to pick the window that I can uh, for weather-wise, and this year it was really tough. So I, I do not have uh, much, uh, I have some, but not, not much baled hay, or less than normal, I should say. So then all my dry hay that I plan for baling, I go over with a rotary tether. So that has been a big improvement because uh, you can bale sooner, but it's also more even dry throughout the field. So one thing I learned is that the large square bales of hay are very unforgiving uh, a bill in any damp hay. So, but I, I use, the, to me, there's kind of an art to Ted, like when and how and so forth. So, um, I, I Ted a lot of hay between 6 and 8 in the morning and probably 9 and 10 at night. So, I just, I have about half throttle PTO and, and a fairly, pa fairly fast gr ground speed. So, and I, I'm still at around that 28, 30 day cutting schedule. So, um, you know, at 25 days, if there's quite a bit there and we got a gorgeous forecast, I'll go ahead and cut some. I won't cut it all, but I'll cut some. So that being said, at 30 days, if rain is imminent, um, I will hold off. So, because as a rule, it doesn't work very good, or at least the last few years with all the rain that we've had, um, uh, a, a lot of rain down hay, uh, I have... I have a hard time with that. So, I, right or wrong, I will just wait. Try to that wait till that passes and, and get the next window. So, um, one thing I changed last year 
is um, we do not store any more hay outside. So it's either under a roof or it's wrapped. So, and last year at the fourth crop, we had some of the best hay and weather we had all year. I got a bunch of dry hay made. And in the past, before I started the baleage, um, I would tarp, I would pot it outside, tarp it, and all that stuff. And um, boy, it's tough. S some of those big thunderstorms come, and they'll pull the plastic off. So what I've done, what we did last year, is um, we wrapped dry hay, and it, it turns out gorgeous. So, and with all the rain we've had the last couple of years. Um, I, I think, I'll show, if we're being real honest with ourselves, um, I think there's a lot more spoilage to um, to the hay that's stored outside, even if it's net wrapped and all that stuff, that, than what we'd like to think. And, pri and if it's good hay, the price of good hay and all that stuff, um, uh, ra wrapping's fairly cheap. So then when I pull, um, when I hay, I pull samples. Um, I have my again. I have my own bale probe. I pull the samples right away before either they're wrapped or um, put it put away. So I feel I can get a good composite sample. So I know what I have. That's one thing with with bales. Uh, it's very easy to inventory where they are. I know the quality. So one thing um, I did after the 2013 and 14 winter is normally I get some hay that will test between 170 and 190 RFQ. So I always want to know where that is. So in the winter when the polar vortex moves in I, I do bump up the grain on my heifer some but that's when I go get that hay um, that tests higher. So that's that's been an improvement for me. I've been able to keep my heifers growing through that and um, you know, that's that's when the days, the highs are like zero or five below, and at night it's, you know, 15 to 25 below. So that that has helped me uh, keep my heifers on track for, for the growth that they need. Okay, we'll go through a few pictures now, if you could go back. Okay, so this is some of my contour strips. Uh, the darker green that's that's in the middle, that was seeded down this year. And um, next spring, that's with that Roundup Ready Harvextra alfalfa. I got a very good stand this year. I was fortunate. And uh, that orchard grass will, will go into that field like next spring. So, so that will be ready to go. And this, this, the windrowed hay is fourth crop. That's, that, that's mostly grass. And that was cut here in September. And there was a lot there. So um, that will hay be hay at least one more year. But when I have the other opposite strips um, seeded down, it will be easy to take these out and put corn. Uh, it will be probably corn, beans, and then I'll go back to hay. So uh, you want to go to the to the next one, please? Oh, okay, let's go back. Okay, so one thing we do all uh, f for haying, we do all all our own cutting and raking and hauling the bales off. I hire all my baling done and all my wrapping done. So this baler um, is from Brett and Beth Duman. They do an outstanding job for me. Um, before I cut hay, I, I send Brett a text. i kind of thinking about when I can bale. And uh, he gets right back to me. He said if it would work or if it, or if it wouldn't. So outstanding service, just out, outstanding. So he, he can be here. He's there within uh, 20 minutes or half an hour um, of the time that he says. So, Mike? Yes. Yeah. All, um, all, my, all, my, all my hay harvested is with the big square baler. So I will wrap. Uh, they're three by four by fives to fit in the wrapper. They go in the Anderson wrapper. So, and the dry hay, um, we, we lengthen those out. So, you want to go to the next one, please? How, okay, so we'll get, okay, I hire within a half a day. Okay, so if we bail five, six at night, um, it's the same thing with, okay, Chris, it's Chris Bergstrom does my wrapping, Chris Bergstrom custom wrapping. He does, again, an outstanding job. I, I, I text him before I cut, 
think if we're going to wrap the hay about, you know, if it would work for him. So he, he kind of gets a head up, heads up. So I do respect his time. And by that I mean is I want to have all the bales in the yard ready to be wrapped before he drives into the driveway. So when he just sets up, we can get them wrapped and we can, I can get them out. So if we bail five, six, seven at night, we'll get the bales uh, rounded up and he'll be there in the next morning to wrap. So I think there's all maybe only one time in two years it was maybe close to 24 hours. But Or, it, you know, if he comes around noon and I can get the bales, then he's usually there be by dark. So we would have a picture of him, but we wrapped most of the hay this year in, in, at night. So, okay. You want to go to the next one, please? Okay. That's just another some of our hay fields. Um, that one is classified also as highly erodible. So if... It, not that you need to. My contour strips, they're all classified as highly erodible. But way, the way they're farmed and the way they're laid out, they are not. Okay. It, it's just done a fantastic job. Actually, on my contour strips, again, which is um, classified as highly erodible, I have less erosion on those than some of my ground um, that's classified as not highly erodible. Okay, that, that's just another picture. So he, he can really eat the hay. That's a new baler for him this year and um, works outstandingly well. Okay. Um, okay, this is uh, kind of how I prefer to wrap hay in that I like to have it on a, on a little bit of a, a slope if we can for drainage and also... Um, we always wrap going uphill. If, if, the, if it's not level, we, we always wrap uphill. So we wrapped the other way once, and um, it was just hard to keep the bales. Um, it's not like a bagger where they have a backstop and cables. It's just hard to keep the bales real tight to one another. So, and another thing is when we wrap hay, if we wrap two kinds of hay, all hay, all one kind of hay goes in first, and then the other kind of hay goes in second. So for, that's for inventory purposes. So I always know what's there. So we don't mix and match two to one, one to two, five to four. It's, it's, all, it's all one kind. Okay. Okay, that's just me cutting hay. We, just, uh, we have a modest line of haying equipment. So, but uh, works very well for us. Yeah, that's a, that's a wheel rake. I also have a rotary rake, and uh, it should be reversed. It should be Nancy in the tractor. She, r she rakes most of the hay this year. So, but uh, she's the only one that could run the camera. So, th so that's why I got in. So, and uh, um, yeah, we just use a couple old wagons. They're hooked, they're four-wheeler. I'm going to run them out, and... Um, um, one thing I learned is uh, a wheel rake like that, if you have heavy hay, mean high yield, and it's fairly wet for wrapping, does not, does not do a very good job. So we also bought a rotary rake. So that, that, that works better with the heavy wet hay. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, that, that's, we just load the bales with the skid loader, and usually Nancy drives the tractor and the wagons, and... Um, it, it goes pretty quick to get the bales rounded up. So. Um, okay. 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 So what, tw um, what 2020 means is I always try to make some improvements. Okay. So the improvements I... Well, I try to make improvements. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they are. So for 2020, um, we're going to do at least three things. So number one is I'm going to get my the acres, my rotable acres that I have the majority of my hay on, we are going to grid sample those. So um, looking at my soil tests, my other row crop ground is grid sampled. Looking at the soil tests this spring, um, just with alfalfa, you can easily... You know, have a pH between 7 and 6.1 in the same field. Um, I think it will be a pretty fast payback 
uh, to, to grin sample my, um, my hay acres. Also, uh, I haven't done it before, but we are going to start to do some tissue tests once or twice a year and, and see, um, see, how, see how we're doing that way. And also, um, I'm going to weigh more bales of hay. So I kind of know my yield. Now it's, now it's a guess, to be honest with you. So dry hay is easy to weigh. You can just get that at any time. Uh, there's a scale about five, six years, or five, six miles from me. I can just run a bale out. I just pick a random bale, run up and weigh it. Um, but baleage is different. Baleage um, will have to get weighed after before I feed it. So, because usually I don't have time to uh, to run b weigh a bale and get it back in time before they get it wrapped, and um, so I'm just going to weigh some more hay. So I I should have some time in the winter. So, uh, and again I'll just get a better idea kind of on my dry matter yields. So. Um, okay, one thing um, I've learned a lot from, and I strongly encourage you guys to think about it anyway is to try some new things okay on your forage acres and by that i mean you don't have to it's not widespread you know do or die just take take something small that you're curious about or whatever and um try it okay and i'll, I'll just give you a, f a quick few examples for for me what i did is um this past spring Okay, I have an old grain drill that I see my alfalfa with. Probably 20, 30 years past its prime. Okay, but it, it still works okay. But there's been getting to be more and more uh, alfalfa that's seeded with fertilizer broadcast um, in our area. So this spring, um, I seeded down some non highly rollable land. I thought I'd, now's the time to take a chance, I thought. So I bumped up the grass in it a little bit. Uh, because it's a short stir. I know I always say I plant Roundup already alfalfa, but I wanted to try something different. So, again, I broadcast the alfalfa, the grass seed, with 250 pounds of fertilizer per acre. And we were fortunate we got rain right away, and uh, it, it worked. So, And the reason I put some grass with it, it's going to be a short life stand. So... And I was a little leery about the broadcasting alfalfa, so I hedged my bets, and I probably put a, it probably was a couple pounds of Italian ryegrass, a pound of orchard grass, maybe a pound of festolium. Uh, so there's a fair amount of grass. So, but I, I thought just in case it failed, I would have some grass, I would have feed there for a year or two. So, but like I say, we seeded it, we got it rolled, it, it rained within a couple hours after we got done, and I, and I got a very nice stand. So I, I would probably do that again. So I may not do that to my contour strips just because there's so much f field edges. Uh, it's it just hard on you when you're driving next to a, a fence line and that alfalfa seed's going out into the ditch. <laughs> so, but... Uh, I learned a couple things. So uh, last year, I've read a lot about metafescue grass. So I, uh, again, I'm very happy with my orchard grass, but I just thought I'd try some. So I bought a bag or two. I seeded some just like a wood uh, into the established alfalfa. And then what I had left over, I just seeded a plot uh, until I ran out of pure, uh, pure metafescue grass. And then um, I purposely stressed it. Um, I think I cut it maybe three times or four the seeding year, but I purposely cut it, um, I think, like October 15th or 20th and, and bailed what was there. And um, we had a tough winter, but it, it came through very good. So uh, the story is probably not finished yet uh, for me for Metafescue. Uh, the one thing with forage is sometimes you have to be more patient than with row crops uh, uh, on the outcome. So like corn and beans you plant in the spring and then you usually know by fall what's what but sometimes with hay it, it just takes a little bit longer so there is a chance down the road that i may add some uh metafescue to to my um orchard grass that i put in so uh the first year that i could get a bag of harvextra low lignin alfalfa i bought it 
So I seeded it separate, and uh, I pulled the samples on it all the seeding year and all the next year. So it, it made a believer out of me. It's not perfect, but uh, it, it, it gives you a good it gives you a good cushion in, in case that um, you get a little extended uh, cutting interval, and if you don't, it, it gives you the better quality. So um, the year before that is um, I cut some hay in September, or mostly alfalfa or alfalfa in September. So I did an informal poll that summer on farmers that cut in September. And um, they all said, yeah, it, uh, it's really not been an issue. Like, we just cut when we get time and, and put it up. So uh, about the 15th or 20th or 25th of September, I just took out my disc bind, went in the back part of the field where nobody could see. I, <laughs> I just put my disc bind down and cut 150 feet. Okay, so the hay got dry. I just took my squ small square baler and bailed it off. And um, I tell you, I, I, I never will cut alfalfa in September again. I lost a lot of plants, a lot. I mean, it, it, you didn't have to count. You could just drive by, and you could see the difference. So I will cut my grass fields in September, but I will not cut my alfalfa. So it just, you know, just some of the things I tried on a small scale to help learn and they they have they have helped me kind of so w which way I go. So with that, it kind of ends my presentation. Um, if you got any questions, please um, please speak up. So hope hopefully I made it somewhat clear uh, uh, on how and why we do things. Do, do, uh, you know, I will. I try not to. I'm sorry? Repeat the question. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The question was, do I cut alfalfa in October? So I will, okay, but there, there's a couple things. Uh, it has to be a fairly young stand, and uh, I have to knead the hay pretty bad. So I would rather cut, um, if I had a so-called cheat, I, I would cheat the first handful of days of September, you know, uh, maybe to, by the set, where we are, our, our growing season, full season corn for us is 95 day. Okay, so I will, you know, I'll cut maybe the third or the fourth of September, but uh, once you get to the seventh and tenth, um, I would have to need it pr pretty bad. So, it, new seeding, my direct seeding, I, I won't have too much trouble cutting that in September. It seems like um, this past year with all the winter kill that we had and winter injury at, at home, th the only thing that uh, withstood all that weather was a, was a new seating. So so I will, but uh, I try very hard not to. So, And at home, most of the people, um, there's some that took a fourth, but their fourth crop was probably about the 5th or the 7th of September. And, and some just because just of the way the late spring and all the rain, uh, some are only going to get three, three crops. So I have just a little bit of fourth crop left to make. So Th that's just my personal thing. And like I say, once, uh, once I do, did the test strip for, the, for cutting the September, that, that kind of sealed the deal. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? How how late? You know, I I boy, anytime in October. Is that okay? So the question was, how how late am I willing to cut grass? So I, I've cut tenth, fifteenth of October. I think the key thing there is make sure, you know, you don't cut it too short. So um, you know, you leave at least four or five inches, um, so so you don't stress stress the alfalfa plant or, or stress the grass that way so and then sometimes usually if I've had a good season um, yield wise I, I will go back out with some potash um, after in, in the fall usually uh, potash is cheaper in the fall and um, 
this past spring, the majority of our fertilizer comes up the Mississippi River, where I am. It comes up to St. Paul, Minnesota. So it comes up on barges. Well, everybody knows what happened. There was no barges that came to St. Paul until July. So urea potash is very expensive. So it's, it's, it's come down some. So, uh, but most of the time, if I take an October cut, I will try to get some fertilizer back out there. I'm not for sure if that's enough time, you know, when we get the rain to help it out any, but um, I, I'm trying to build my my uh, potash levels up a little bit too so, so it doesn't hurt. So, any other questions? Mike? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So, I'm sorry? Okay, I'm sorry. The question was is, are we inoculating the baleage? And yes, I do. So, um, it just... Uh, um, I'm not for sure the product that he has on the baler, but um, I always tell him, you know, to, to do the recommended amount. So sometimes uh, the truth of the matter is, is um, sometimes our moisture level on the baleage gets fairly low. So sometimes with the grass hay, if you have good drying, it can blow by that 45% fairly soon. Or fairly quick, I should say. By the time I get home and get it raked and we get it bailed, so I, I as of yet, um, he does a good job wrapping. Uh, he uses good quality plastic. He gets a lot of wraps on, and we haven't had any trouble um, saying wrapping maybe 30% hay. So, and on a, on the other hand, if I plan on dry hay, and uh, I start raking and I'm not real comfortable on the moisture. And by that, I mean, you know, if, if I need it at 17 and um, I feel maybe it's 20, okay, we, we will go ahead and wrap that hay. So, and, and that's worked out very well. So, it's maybe not perfect, but uh, it's way, way better than a, a hay fire. So, uh, one thing I don't like um, real... Uh, wet baleage, and by that I mean 50, 55 percent. Um, there's some, but I got to know where that is because um, we've had a little trouble in the winter. If you, if you get baleage at 50 percent and it doesn't get above zero for for a week, okay, th those bales kind of freeze. Uh, not real bad, but um, I don't I don't process the hay at all. I just put it in the feeder, and um, you know. I don't, I don't expect my heifers to chew on an ice cube. So if it comes to that, I, I try to I take the twines off, and then we kind of split it up. So it, it's once it gets in there and gets broke up, then they, they can eat it. But if you just put it in there as a cube, uh, if it's 50, 55 percent, and it's not that many days of the year that, that, that it is like that, but it, it has happened. So any other questions? Um, the question was the moisture on my baleage. Uh, I'd say most of my baleage is between 25 and 40. So, and I, I, I'm not saying I'm going to promote that, that that's the way it should be. It's, it's maybe not baleage then. It's more like maybe sweet hay, they call it, or something like that. But um, on the other hand, we, we haven't had any, any problem with it either. So, but th there is... Um, you know, around that 40, if you can get around 40% or low 40s, you know, that that is an ideal moisture. So, but like I say, just the reality, um, when the baler comes, when I can do it and all that stuff. Um, so, one thing with the crone baler, it, it appears that uh, he can really turn up the compression on that. And um, that... I have I've fed some baleage out of that baler, but hopefully uh, it will squeeze some of that air out. So, but th those bales are more dense compared with the baler that he had before. So, I can just tell because I just weighed one, and uh, there there was a big difference. So, uh, okay, I would uh, the four the three by four by five the one I weighed this year, and I'd have to look for sure uh, the moisture. I believe it was probably be around 30% or 35. 
It weighed uh, 1,250 pounds. Oh, I, I, I take that back. That was a dry bale. That was a dry bale. 1,200, and the one I weighed last year uh, was about 860 pounds. So it made such a difference, I went home, got another bale, and weighed that, and it, it weighed the same. So that, that's one of the things I'm going to do in the 2020 is I need to weigh more bales, okay, just so I, I get a better handle on, on my dry matter yield. So, because to be honest, uh, the first crop that I got was, it was terrible yield. It was very, it was miserable for yield. So the second crop was much better. Um, to be honest, I thought, well, I, I would have hoped for a little bit better. But if there's more hay in the bale, you know, that made up for it, made up for it there too. So, and usually when you feed it, uh, well, if you go through a TMR, that, that's fairly easy to weigh. But mine doesn't go through a TMR, so. Any other questions? Yes. It does. It does. Yeah, well. Uh, true, but uh, how accurate are your monitors? <laughs> you know? Your, mo your monitors are only as good as they're calibrated for, you, you know. But it gives me some idea, for sure, for sure. So, um, but I, I think uh, I kind of asked him what, what the average weight was, and I, I think it was like um, we were probably, he was probably about 100 pounds off from, from what the scale said and what the bales, what the, what the baler said compared with the scale. And it was in the, it was in the favor of the scale. Okay, so. So I, that is true, like I say, but I just don't know how often they cap, calibrate it. I don't know how they do it, you know. And then moisture plays a moisture plays a part in it too. So, any other questions? Well, if not, I, I thank you all for coming, and uh, I hope you got something from this presentation. And uh, I thank you uh, that. Uh, the seminars get put on for education because um, everybody can learn something sometime. So thanks. <laughs>